All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Meinzen, and I'm here with the Columbia Sioux Watershed Council to welcome you to the first of our winter webinar series. Um, so in lieu of our typical winter workshops um, this year, um, we're going to learn virtually through a webinar series about various topics um, in the Columbia Sioux Watershed. And this morning, very excited to welcome um, our first guest, um, Laura Gujian, the um, ecologist with Portland Parks and Recreation um, Cities Nature Program. So first we'll talk with her about her work as an ecologist, um, and then we'll head out into the field with her virtually um, for a little snapshot of her field biology work in the watershed, and then return for a live Q&A session. So you can ask Laura any of your questions about watershed ecology or science or wildlife. So first, uh, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you work and uh, what's involved in your job? Absolutely. So my name is Laura Gudrian and I'm a natural resource ecologist with Portland Parks and Rec. So I work for the city um, and I get to work on natural areas throughout the city. So in the parks and rec system, we have two different kinds of parks. We have developed parks that have um, your soccer fields and your picnic tables and your swing sets. And then we have natural areas like Oaks Bottom and Whitaker Ponds that are really set aside more for wildlife and passive recreation, maybe taking a walk down a trail. And so I have about 19 different natural areas areas up and down the Willamette River as well as the Columbia Slough that I've kind of am supposed to take care of. So I'm supposed to make them as best and healthy functioning ecologically as possible. So that's how I spend my days and sometimes that means going to a lot of meetings. Sometimes that means doing wildlife surveys which I'm going to share a little bit with you today. Um, and sometimes that means working with the public um, like folks like Thomas and the Watershed Council. Awesome. And um... What first sparked your, your interest in ecology? Well, when I was growing up, I didn't have any role models that were doing kind of field biology and ecology. I thought I loved science and I was good at it, but I thought the only thing you could do with science is be a teacher or a doctor. And so I was like, well, of the two, I guess I'll be a teacher because I didn't want to be a doctor. Uh, but then when I got to college, I um, met an advisor who was doing field research and I went out on weekends and over holidays with him and, and we did some frog research and it was so much fun and I realized there was this whole field out there open where you could you know have a job chasing frogs and digging in the dirt and planting plants and working with the public and it kind of opened up a whole new world for me so that's how I got into this. Very cool and in terms of um, ecology and habitat and wildlife what makes the Columbia Sioux watershed in particular an uh, exciting place for you to work? The watershed is exciting for a number of reasons. The history of it is pretty cool. The history of the land. Um, we have some really old maps from when the land was first surveyed pre-settlement um, that show kind of how the wetlands and the sloughs and the channels all looked and the types of vegetation that was there. So we have kind of a really great pre-settlement photograph of what the slough used to look like. And then fast forward to now and we see the influences of urbanization and industrialization and um, a lot of uh, those impacts from humans. And I find it's really interesting to work with people that live in the watershed that um, are eager to help minimize those effects of the human impacts. Um, and the Columbia Slough Watershed is a great place for that because you have so many private landowners, so many different businesses, companies, groups, organizations that are really excited and interested in making the watershed healthier. That's very cool. Um, and I know you work a lot with turtles in particular. And I was just wondering if you could tell and perhaps show us more about the species of turtles that live in the watershed, help us identify them. Sure. So I'm actually surrounded by buckets of turtles right now and I'm holding two in my hand because they're really cold and I'm trying to warm them up. Um, but uh, first, before I start showing you critters, I need to um, give a little uh, disclaimer. So all of the turtles that I'm going to show you today, these are not pets, okay? These are education turtles that I have borrowed from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, it is actually illegal to have any of these species as pets in Oregon. And so these were all animals that were confiscated for one reason or another and are now living their lives at the office at OGFW. Um, and it allows folks like me to come and bring them and, and show you what species we have here. So just a disclaimer, these are not pets. They're going back actually as soon as we're done here uh, to the office. 
Um, so yeah, I have four different species today. I have two native species and I have two non-native species. So in Oregon, we have two native species and both of them are um, in trouble. Um, both are listed by the state um, as sensitive species. So their populations are declining, they're having issues with habitat, they're having issues with diseases and other threats. And so they're both kind of under the microscope for protection and conservation. So the first one that I'm gonna show you is one that's really common in the Columbia Slough. It's called the Western Painted Turtle. Um, and this one is uh, kind of what I spend most of my time on just because it's so common. Oh. I should have brought a towel because these guys are pretty wet. <laughs> so this is a, a little painted turtle. Let me see if I can get the camera to work well. There we go. So it's called the painted turtle because it looks like it has these yellow stripes, painted stripes kind of all over its skin, its arms, its legs. And then the bottom shell, which is called the plastron, is this really beautiful kind of orange and black pattern. And that pattern is unique to each turtle. So you can actually, we take photographs when we do surveys of this so that we can use it like a fingerprint. So we can actually identify each animal based on what that pattern looks like. Um, and then the back shell is called the carapace. And the carapace on the painted turtle is kind of not super exciting. It's kind of like a mottled greeny brown color. There's a little bit of yellow striping kind of on the edges, um, but really it's that yellow and black striping on the head and then that bright orange underneath. So even if they're basking on a log, usually you can see that bright orange right under their chin. Um, and that's how you can tell that it's the painted turtle. Um, and then my other, so our other native turtle is the pond turtle. So um, the uh, Northwestern pond turtle is actually in even a little bit more trouble than the painted turtle. We don't have very many in the Columbia Slough. It's been a while since they've been caught there. Um, and this one has actually been petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. So in a couple of years, there's gonna be a decision whether or not it's gonna be federally protected as well as state protected. Um, and I actually have a male and a female, so I'm gonna show you both of them um, and how to tell the difference. Uh, so let's do the male first. So this is our male pond turtle. So you can see no striping, right? Doesn't have the, the yellow and the black striping. You can see how pale he is. He's very white. So this is the male and that's typical of the males is to have that white skin um, kind of right around their neck and their throat. The bottom of their shell is again, kind of boring as is the top of their shell, kind of boring. Um, so these guys I like to think of as kind of, um, when you're sitting on a log, um, they look like old army helmets, like Civil War army helmets, if you've ever seen those um, on like Antiques Roadshow. So they're just kind of like this mound of kind of greenish brown. Um, and then they sometimes will have a yellow chin and the males will often have this white chin. So that's something that you look for. Um, and then I don't know if he'll cooperate with me, but you can see his tail and see how big his tail is, super long and thick. So that also tells us that this is a male. So that's our male pond turtle. And then our female. Let her drip dry a second. Okay, so this is our female. You can see she doesn't have that same white. She has a little bit, but it's not quite as dramatic as with the male. Um, same thing, they're, they're plastron, the bottom shell, as well as the carapace, the top shell are kind of nondescript, kind of boring. Um, but she has a much smaller, shorter, skinnier tail than the male did. So that's how we can tell um, she's a female as well. And then with the pond turtles, let me see if I can grab them at the same time. So their head shapes are a little bit different and I don't know if they're gonna stick their heads out. But you can see the, the male has a little bit of a snout on him and the female is being shy, but she has kind of a flat, a flat blunt edged face. So let's see if I can, well, I don't know if they're gonna do it. <laughs> Wildlife. So you can see he's got a little bit of a nose that kind of sticks out. And then the female, she's kind of straight up and down. She doesn't have that little kind of protruding little nose there. So there's some shape differences to their faces as well that tell them apart, male and female. So those are our two native species um, and they get to be pretty good size. Um, people ask me all the time. So this is kind of a good sized, um, this is a pond turtle shell, but this is a good size one. So this is being a nice big female adult. Um, painted turtles, maybe a slight bit bigger, but about the same size. And you'll see why I'm telling you this in a second when I show you the non-natives. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so then we have two non-native species. I'm going to show you these first because they're so stinking cute. So when I went to pick up these turtles, um, Susan Barnes at ODFW, the wildlife biologist, had just dug up a snapping turtle nest that was emerging. So the babies were coming out of the eggs. And so I have here two teeny tiny little snapping turtle hatchlings. They're about the size of a quarter and they're very cold because I've been keeping them out on my deck. And then last night it got down to 32 degrees. So I had to rush and put them inside. But I have two of them here and they're definitely alive. <laughs> you can tell because if you kind of pull on their foot, they, they pull their foot back in. Um, but they're super teeny tiny and they're fresh out of the egg, like just a few days old. So they're kind of special and I wanted to show you guys those. I'm just leaving them right here to warm up a little bit. They're not the most active of creatures. And being babies, they're not going to be super active anyway because their defense mechanism is just to hide in the vegetation usually. So they're not really triggered to, to move around. But now I have a juvenile who's a few years old. Um, and this guy's fun. I have to be a little bit careful how I handle them because snapping turtles do snap. Uh, that's their their defense mechanism. So this is our snapping turtle here. So I'll try to give you different views so you can see how he's different from the other two that you just saw. So he's a little bit more like, I think, armored, I guess is what I would say. So if you look at the back of the shell, he's got kind of this serration on the bottom. He's very like bulky and just like he's wearing armor plating, right? But the cool thing is while they're carapace, the back shell um, is very much like you would expect for a turtle. Their bottom shell, the plastron, is tiny. Look at that. Isn't that cool? So you actually have all of this soft tissue going on around the plastron that makes them very vulnerable. So um, if you ever are able to get a snapping turtle onto its back, it's actually <laughs> it's to, to do that, <laughs> to try to flip itself back over and to try to bite whatever has flipped it. So it has this crazy long neck. Um, that comes all the way out like this. Um, and that's to help protect that belly. And I'm not sure why they have such a small plastron. I don't know if that's, um, evolutionarily, I don't know if that's helpful to them in some way, um, but it does make them vulnerable to predators. And then they have this long tail. You can see their tail is way longer than any of our natives as well. And these guys are a little bit different in that they're sit and wait predators. So they'll actually stay at the bottom of the pond and they have a little uh, pink tongue that they kind of dangle in their mouth and they wait for a fish to swim by and go after that little tongue that looks like a worm and then they grab the fish. So these guys are kind of sit and wait. They don't move around too much and so you don't really see them basking up on logs and rocks and things because they stay in the water for the most part. And then our last species, uh, if I can find her, there she is, is um, called a red-eared slider. So this one looks very much like the native painted turtle. So she also has the black and white stripes on the neck and on the arms. But you can see the difference is the bottom shell. See how yellow that is? So it's yellow with these big black dots. So same thing, if, if this one's basking, you're gonna see that kind of mustard yellow color. Whereas with the painted again, you'll see that kind of reddish orange. So even if they're basking, you'll see those stripes, but then you'll see that plastron showing right under their chin. And this one is called a red-eared slider. I don't know if you can see, but she actually has a red stripe on her head, just behind her eye. So they literally have red ears. Um, and these are very common pet turtles, or they, they have been very common pet turtles. Unfortunately, um, both snappers and painteds live a long time, and people don't realize that when they get them as pets. And so they can live to be 30, 40 years old. Um, in captivity. And so a lot of times people will kind of get tired of them after five or 10 years and they'll go and they'll put them in the slough. And so um, the problem with that is that not only are they introducing kind of a whole new animal to a system that's not used to it, um, but they're also potentially introducing um, aquarium vegetation that's not native and diseases and fungus and things like that. Um, and these guys tend to be a little bit more um, uh, aggressive. So they'll actually push natives off of the um, basking sites. Um, they also have a lot more eggs per female every year. So once they get into a site, they tend to kind of take over and, and go crazy. Very cool. And then just to show you the contrast. So again, remember, this was the, the native, right? This is the size of the native. This is the size of the slider. <laughs> the oh, my goodness. Can't even get it on screen there. 
So they get much bigger, much fatter. Um, they produce many more babies and uh, they kind of take over. So um, that's one reason whenever, anytime we see the red-eared slider or the snapper, we try to take them out of the system. Um, we can't actually leave them there. And then this is what the uh, snapping turtle shell looks like. This is actually still small. They can be quite a bit bigger than this, but again, the size difference is pretty dramatic. So, <laughs> and then I also brought some eggs because I thought you might want to see what turtle eggs look like. So right now, this time of year, all of our turtle um, eggs are hatching. So the female lays a nest in the ground in like a hole in the ground. And then the, um, once it starts, we get some warm rains, the babies are triggered to dig themselves out of the hole. So this is a good time to potentially actually find these little guys <laughs> around Whitaker Ponds and other uh, slough sites that have uh, breeding turtles. And so this is what the eggs look like. They're almost like little ping pong balls and they don't have a hard shell like a bird. They're actually leathery and kind of soft. Um, and so it makes them again, a little bit more vulnerable. That's why the, the mom has to dig, dig down and, and hide them in the dirt. Um, and even then raccoons and possums and um, domestic dogs will definitely prey on them and, and dig them up. And skunks too, I think I've heard quite a bit about skunks as well. So that's our eggs. And then these are um, some egg shells to show you what it looks like because sometimes when they hatch, you can actually find these shells on the ground. So if you ever see something like this, they look like wrapped up, curled up little, um, you know, kind of white ping pong balls. Um, that can tell you that um, either that nest was predated and the eggs were eaten or that the hatchlings successfully made it out. So that's what you're looking for if you're ever digging around near a pond and you find uh, something. So that's what they look like. So that's what I got for you. <laughs> that is very cool. Wow, that's incredible. I think I have seen those pieces of eggs before. Yeah. At Whitaker Ponds, actually. Well, and Whitaker Ponds too does get some predation by raccoons and skunks. And so um, often we'll have, if you walk through the, um, the little nesting area that's kind of right between the two ponds, you can find the nest, uh, the shell fragments. And that's because they've been dug up and eaten and discarded. So, gotcha. yeah. How deep do these turtles bury their eggs typically? Well, if you think about it, they're digging their, um, their nest cavity with their back legs. So it's going to be as deep as their back legs are long. So depending on the size of the female, it could be anywhere from kind of a four inch to maybe a six inch depth. And they're basically reaching as far down as they can and scraping out the mud and the rocks and the dirt. Um, and then they lay their eggs in and then they cover it all back up with dirt. And then the last thing they do is actually pull leaves and sticks on top of it to try to camouflage it to keep the predators away. Wow, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> So what role kind of do these turtles play in, in the watershed as a whole? Like what do they eat? Um, yeah. What might eat them, if anything? Absolutely. So um, these guys are a pretty important part of the food web in the Columbia Slough. So one of their most important jobs is that they're um, what we call decomposers. So they're actually eating a lot of the dead stuff. So if a fish dies or any other animal dies in the slough and it's like hanging out at the bottom decomposing, these guys are going to be attracted to it and they're going to come and clean it up. So they're kind of like a garbage disposal um, or a vacuum of the slough. So they're helping to keep everything nice and clean. They also eat live things. So if there is, you know, aquatic worms or snails, things like that, that they can get, um, they'll definitely go after that as well. And sometimes they'll eat vegetation, but we're not super sure if they're actually eating the vegetation for the vegetation or if they're eating bugs that are in the vegetation. Then they just happen to eat some of the plants as well. Um, so yeah, that's mostly what they're eating. And then in terms of what eats them, really it's these little guys that are the most vulnerable. So when these guys are, you know, coming out of their egg and they're crawling around on the, on the shoreline trying to get down to the water, these guys get picked off really easily by herons and bullfrogs and just about anything that can fit them in their mouths. Once they get to be kind of the size that I showed you, um, they're pretty sturdy and they're not, their shell is hard. So right now this guy's shell is actually really soft. You can kind of squeeze them <laughs> gently. Um, and uh, the, once they're out of the ground for about, you know, six or months or so, they get hard and they grow really fast. So they'll double in size. So this guy will get to be, you know, 
twice that size and still small, but twice that size <laughs> within the first growing season, which is, you know, by the end of next year. So um, they grow pretty quickly, but they're pretty fragile when they're newborns. Um, and then once they get to be big enough, they don't really get preyed upon too much except for the females because it's the females that are coming out of the pond mm. to their nests. So when the turtles are in the pond, they're pretty safe, right? Like if they get spooked, they can just dive down into the water and swim away. But if they're up on land, even though they can actually move pretty quickly, um, that's where, again, the raccoons and the skunks and the possum and the domestic dogs can get them. Um, and they'll definitely kill the females as well um, as going after the, the nests. Okay. And um, you mentioned that they live sometimes 30 years or more in captivity. Um, have you studied or do you know how long they might be living in the wild in our watershed? In the wild, they can they live at least 20 years. So um, we have, um, there's a way that you can tell the age of the turtles because they actually shed their, they shed their shell like a snake sheds its skin every year. And it leaves behind a little line called an annuli. So kind of like little tree, tree lines, tree growth lines. And so you can usually tell up to a certain amount how old the turtle is. So up until about 10 or 12 years old, you can tell. After that, they start growing so slowly um, and they start to kind of wear down their shell a little bit that those lines start to go away. So we have turtles that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we knew were already 10 to 15 years old and we're still catching them in the slough. So we know that they can survive at least 20, 30 years. And then the pond turtles, there was a study done back, I wanna say it was in the 70s and 80s. And those turtles, some of those turtles are still being caught today. So wow. uh, yeah, they're pretty long lived, um, which is one of the good things because that means that they can have lots of babies, they have lots of opportunities to reproduce. Um, and hopefully to uh, protect and to conserve the species. Absolutely, that's amazing. Um, and you are doing some research on turtles, um, which we talked about earlier. I'm just curious what questions you're interested in answering or what mysteries um, you're investigating yeah. with regards to our turtles. <laughs> so there's been a lot of research. So there was actually a lot like a big um, burst of research that happened kind of in the late 90s and early 2000s for our two native species. Um, and I'm interested in kind of long-term generational data. So I like to go out and trap and um, capture um, animals for many, many years in a row, because then you can kind of see how they grow. You can see how they change. Um, you can get ideas for um, sex ratios in the population. So do we have more females or more males? And is that gonna be good and, and sustainable for the population? Um, and then you can also get an idea of, you know, these young painted turtle, the young painted turtle I just showed you is, you know, maybe three or four years old. In a couple more years, it'll be sexually mature and starting to lay its own nests. And so then pretty soon we'll have its babies and we'll have that generational information that we can um, kind of go back through. And then the, the hatchlings themselves, the little guys, these guys are a mystery <laughs> because they basically come out of the, the ground I don't know if you can see this, but they actually still have a little bit of a, a yolk sac. You know, you yeah. can see right in the middle there, it's kind of like a little bubble. So that yolk sac is what they're feeding off of because they need to be in the water to, um, to swallow, to eat. So for potentially months, they're wandering around on land trying to get from the nest to the water and they're super vulnerable. We don't really know what they're looking for. We don't really know what kind of habitat they're, they're interested in. Sometimes, um, you know, they'll hang out in the vegetation and not move for months. And then sometimes they'll buzz straight down to the water. So that early life stage is really um, a mystery for us. Um, there have been some researchers that have put little teeny tiny um, GPS trackers, kind of like the size and, and weight of a hair on them because these guys are so light, um, just to try to track them for the first couple of years of life. Um, and we haven't gotten too much information. So the really young ones are really important and then kind of that long-term data so that we can see because they're such a long-lived animal what happens over time and what do we need to be thinking about in terms of managing the land for them long term very cool um and where where are the turtles now in the winter time where do they all go? <laughs> good question so in the winter time um they actually overwinter so they'll actually um uh, dig down into the pond. So there's kind of two different strategies. So some of them will dig down into the mud of the pond and they'll hang out in the mud um, and their bodies kind of really slow down. So 
I, I tend to think of it like a hibernation, but really mammals are the only ones that hibernate. These guys do something different. They don't, there isn't really a technical word for it. So they just kind of go into the mud and they slow down and they survive the kind of super cold freezing temperatures. Sometimes the pond turtles though will actually go into the uplands. So they'll go into the forest and dig down under the duff, like the leaves and the pine needles and the soft um, dirt and that sort of thing. And they'll hang out under the frost line there. So most of the time they go for the aquatic, but sometimes the pond turtles will actually go into the, into the forests. And that also makes, um, that's also kind of produces a threat because they need to be able to have that aquatic and the upland connected safely so that they can move between them as needed throughout the year. Um, when it gets too hot, they'll also do that. They'll also go into the forest and hang out in the shade underneath the leaves and stuff to stay cool. So that upland and wetland um, habitat close together safe is, is pretty important for them. Absolutely, oh, that's really cool. And question I've been wondering about, how do they breathe when they're spending the winter down at the bottom of the pond? <laughs> I know exactly what you're going for, Thomas. <laughs> okay. So, uh, painted and pond turtles have a special patch of skin around their cloaca, which is where they go to the bathroom. So, um, reptiles and amphibians have one hole that everything comes out of. So, all of their waste comes out of it, the eggs come out of it, all that kind of stuff. And... Um, the skin around that opening is really sensitive and they can actually breathe oxygen through that skin. So it's called cloacal breathing, or if you want to be crude, butt breathing. <laughs> um, and it's a really cool adaptation to allow them to be able to still take in some oxygen from the water when they're buried down um, in the middle of winter. That's incredible. <laughs> That's <so cool. laughs> and there's a lot of insects actually that do something similar that have kind of little snorkels coming out of their back ends. Um, so it's actually a pretty common adaptation. Wow. That's awesome. I'm a little jealous, I have to say, <laughs> those adaptations. <laughs> um, so, so what do you see in your work as um, the greatest threats to, to these turtles? I know both of our native species are um, under threat. Um, and are there any things that ordinary people can do to help minimize those threats? Yeah, so I think the biggest kind of overarching issue is habitat, right? So either habitat degradation or just loss of habitat in general. So in the SLU, because it's a pretty big industrial area, there are issues with um, heavy metals and chemicals in the water and in the soils and that sort of thing. And these guys are living in that water and digging into that soil. So that's an issue for them. Um, but then we also just have a lot of development. We have people building buildings and houses and and that sort of thing right next to these water uh, waterways. Um, and that either, you know, just completely wipes out the habitat so they can't, there's no place for them to come up on shore and nest, or it might separate that wetland and aquatic, or that wetland and upland habitat, maybe with a road or a parking lot or something like that and make it that much harder for them to be able to move between them. So in general, um, I think we need to be a little bit smarter about where we put impervious pavement and where we leave corridors for wildlife to be able to still move through those systems. Again, we're really lucky that the SLU has so many miles of backwaters that are so special for certain species of birds and reptiles and fish. We need to take care of it and we need to keep it connected to other pieces though so that all of these animals can really satisfy all their, their life stages. Um, in general, you know, educate people, you know, by paying attention to this webinar today, hopefully you've learned a few things, everybody, and uh, can share the information with family and friends. Um, go to Whitaker Ponds, go to Smith and Bybee, observe these turtles, appreciate them. Um, and if you ever find a turtle up on land, um, you should call the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. So um, regardless of what kind it is, whether it's a native or not native, if it's a not native, we don't want to put it back in the wetlands. So you actually want to take it, put it in a bucket and call Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. If it's a native, it's still important because we can take pictures and we can actually collect data on it. So um, no matter what kind of turtle it is, it's, it's best to, to call Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and they can kind of find the, the closest researcher or biologist that can go out and, and respond and, and see what's going on. So last year we actually had a turtle picked up at 72nd and Killingsworth in the SLU. It was in um, uh, Transition Center's uh, parking lot. We don't know how it got there. It just somehow showed up. And so they kind of corralled it in the backyard in a little fenced-in area. And I went out and um, 
we weighed it and measured it and made sure it was healthy and then we put it into Whitaker ponds. So we can also make sure that those turtles get to a place where they can have long, healthy lives, where they have mates, where they can have babies, all that kind of thing. Absolutely, cool. Um, and you mentioned Whitaker ponds and also heavy metals, which is a good segue to a quick question that I've gotten from some people recently about what might be happening to Whitaker ponds um, this spring potentially. Yeah, so um, Whitaker Ponds is part of the industrial area of the slough. Um, there have been a number of businesses that have been polluting the slough, um, sometimes not knowingly, sometimes knowingly. Um, and uh, one of the companies that, that um, has its business on the slough is doing a big cleanup project. They're trying to get rid of all of those accumulated PCBs and PAHs and chemicals and heavy metals and that sort of thing. So at Whitaker Pond, we have an East Pond and a West Pond. The West Pond is the one that's closest to 47th where you park. The East Pond is a little bit further away. It's a little bit um, kind of hidden. Um, and that's the one that has most of the contamination in it. And so um, Metro Metals is the company and they're working with the Department of Environmental Quality, Portland Parks and Rec, the Watershed Council, all these partners to drain that east pond. They're gonna drain that east pond in the summer. They're gonna dig out the areas of sediment and contamination. And then they're gonna put a six inch layer of sand on top of what's left because that sand then is, acts as a cap and it prevents anything from kind of percolating up back into the water column. Mm -hmm. The goal is really to keep all of those heavy metals and those pollutants out of the food web, out of, um, you know, kind of access to the animals. Um, and so that's the project that's gonna be happening this coming summer. So we're hoping, it was supposed to happen last summer, but then COVID, so who knows what 2021 um, holds for us, but we're hoping that it's gonna go forth next summer. And if that's the case, if you happen to visit Whitaker Ponds, you might notice um, some fencing, some construction, suddenly there's no water in the pond. Um, but there's a, a lot of information available on the DEQ website for folks that want more details. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you so much, um, Laura. Sure. This has been wonderful. And um, we're gonna transition now to some clips um, from the field um, to see a little bit of your survey work. Um, and then we'll be back for a question and answer period from um, our guests on this webinar. So thank you so much. Excellent, thank you. These are the turtle traps? These are my turtle traps. No turtles today. We use sardines and cat food for bait. Uh huh. Um, it usually turns out very well. <laughs> so these are called funnel traps. So the turtle can come in through this funnel and then they get stuck inside the trap. Gotcha. Wow. So sardines and cat food, you said? Yes. How does that compare to a turtle's typical diet? A turtle's typical diet, they're, they're really decomposers, so they're eating all the dead stuff, so they're already eating all the dead fish and okay. bits of, you know, organic matter. They eat a little bit of vegetation, but mostly they're going after um, the dead meat that's in there, insects and such. No. <laughs> well, it is late in the season. So do you suppose the turtles have all burrowed down now, by now? I think they are, yeah. Okay. Usually the fall is a good time to trap because they're trying to eat a lot uh -huh. before they go into overwintering. So they're really happy to go into the nets and feed. but. I think we just tipped over into that done for They're the season. Down in the mud now. Yeah. This is what, October 14th. Right. My passion is to do the, the earthwork, but also to involve the community. 
um, and help people understand why this is important and how exciting and awesome it is. So yeah, that's why I do what I do. Fall in the water. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll stop the film. <laughs> so you want to tell me what you're doing here, Laura? Awesome. This is our sketchiest spot. <laughs> so, um, Good water, yeah. though. And you even got a, you even got a, a fish. Oh, really? Yeah. Hey! Done. All right. Let me know when you're in position and I'll get started. Every time we come out, this log gets a little bit more degraded. I know. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yep. And go. So we're doing a 60 second sample. Let's see what's living here. I'm going. Five, four, three, two, one, Woohoo! All right. Okay. Some fish. Oh, yeah. Oh, like a toothfish. Ooh. What a haul. All right. I'm going to haul that bagger stick. Ooh. <laughs> this is going to be fun to clean out my net. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go see what we got. All right, tell me what you're doing here, Laura. So now we have our samples, and we are going through and pulling out all of the macroinvertebrates that we can find. So mm -hmm. macro meaning things that you can see with the eye. So we don't want to necessarily look for, you know, teeny tiny microscopic critters, but anything that we can see that's moving, we want to collect and put in our sample. And this is a little container filled with alcohol. So we're fixing the critters um, in alcohol, and then the next, the next job is to go through this sample and separate it out and identify everything that's in it. Mm -hmm. So we get an idea of the abundance as well as the diversity of the different types of macroinvertebrates. And the idea is that different macroinvertebrates are different indicators of water quality. So there's an index that I found that I can use, um, that I can compare what we find in these samples to, and it'll tell us how healthy the water quality is based on what's living in it. So that's the, the general idea of what we're doing. Cool. What do you have there? Fish. <laughs> Woo! Very cool. We also just like to nerd out on weird things. <laughs> cool. Yeah, see the snails like exploded? Um. <laughs> I don't know why they do that. Only some of them do it. And I don't know if it's... Maybe they're pregnant? Maybe they're... Wow. I don't know. <laughs> That's crazy. But it's kind of disgusting. <laughs> what are you two especially excited about finding when you see it? If anything. I think it's just interesting to see how the samples differ as well as throughout the year. So we do the sampling once a month from March through October. So this is our last sample of the year for this year. And just to see how everything kind of hatches and grows up and changes throughout the season. Um, but then also seeing differences between the East Pond and the West Pond, there's definitely different habitat. Mm -hmm. um, it's just always kind of striking. So we usually find something that we're like, oh, did you see this? Did you see that? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've got our trusty uh, photo books that we can try to figure out all the different things that we find. Very cool. So we have a lot of questions coming in.
Um, Laura, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Awesome. Great. Um, so first question is, um, and that goes back to something you mentioned in the video. Um, if you see an invasive turtle, what should you do? Who should you call? Um, and does it depend if it's in the water or on land? Um, that's our first question. Sure. So if the turtle is in the water, chances are you're not going to be able to catch it. They are very well adapted to the aquatic system. And uh, even if you see the little nose or their head poking up or they're sitting on a log, as soon as you get within, you know, even 10 or 20 feet, they're going to be in the water diving down into the mud. So um, if you're somehow able to catch a turtle in the water, it might mean that they're injured or sick. Um, but most likely you're going to catch a turtle uh, when they're up on land. Um, and that'll be primarily the females um, kind of in the spring and summer when they're nesting. So ideally, the best thing, best thing to do is to leave them alone. Um, ideally, if you can tell if it's a red-eared slider or a snapping turtle, one of the non-natives, um, the best thing to do would be to put it in the five-gallon bucket and to call Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I can put um, a phone number and email address in the chat um, in a minute to uh, direct anybody that finds uh, critters, but um, especially if it's a native, if it's a pond turtle or a painted turtle, just let it do what it's doing. It knows what it's doing. It's not lost. It's not, you know, wandering. Um, just let it go ahead and, and finish nesting so that it can reproduce. Awesome. Um, another question we had was, if people don't want their pet turtles anymore, where is a safe place to take them? Um, asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> of course, always asking for a friend. Um, so it kind of depends. Um, so don't put it in the, in the environment is the key thing. Okay. Don't put it in the water. Don't put it, you know, anywhere outside. Ideally you could find a friend or somebody that would like to take it on, um, that would get responsibility for it. Um, you could also, I don't know if you can do this, but you might be able to take it to a pet store and see if they'd be willing to take it, um, and rehome it. Um, the last option, again, would be Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, because depending on the species that it is, they have a list of people that have special permits that allow them to take in all kinds of different uh, reptile species. Um, and so there are different rescue areas and, and that sort of thing that um, ODFW has contacts with, and they can find a new home for it. Awesome. Um, another question is... Uh... This is a bit of a long one. In my St. John's neighborhood, a Western painted turtle came up from the Lamp River and went six blocks into the neighborhood and onto my property. Is that normal? And what should what amount of greenway ideally should we aim for for the Lamet? Oh, that's a great question. So um, the uh, <laughs> my fantasy answer is all of the greenway. It should all be for turtles. Um, but turtles will move um, quite a distance um, to get either between ponds or to get to a nesting area. So they can move a couple kilometers even. Um, I think the most, most research shows kind of 300 to 500 meters as being kind of the, the farthest distance that they'll regularly move to find a nest. So six blocks isn't um, too unheard of. And especially if they're nesting in your yard, it's probably because your yard happens to have the best nesting habitat for them. Um, so again, as long as you can make sure that it's definitely a native turtle, leave them alone, let them go on their way. They will find their way back to the river. Um, if you ever find a turtle in the middle of the road or in danger of being hit, you can help it cross the road in the direction that it's facing. Because again, it knows where it wants to go. We just have put all these barriers in its way that can um, uh, cause, you know, death and destruction. So you want to just keep moving it in the same direction that it was going and it will keep going on its way. Another question, how does climate change influence um, these specific species? Is there one type that will survive higher temperatures? <laughs> uh, that's a really great question. So in general, when we think about climate change, we think about warmer and drier. And different parts of the world and different parts of the United States um, are going to be affected differently. Like we think that we're actually going to get more rain potentially here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, either way, more rain or less rain, hotter or colder, any of those, excuse me, any of those pretty significant changes are going to change the habitat. So if you think about um, what triggers these animals to go through their different life stages, so what triggers 
them to wake up in the winter um, and come up and start basking in the spring. Usually it's those first warm winter rains. So if those change in timing or in uh, number and frequency, that could change how, how often and how long the turtles are um, going into that overwintering stage. And then also the um, uh, our turtles have a really cool um, way of determining sex. So they're a, a temperature dependent uh, species. So um, the temperature of the nest is what determines the sex of the babies that are hatching in it. And it's very fine tuned down to just a degree or two. So if our environment starts to warm or cool, even just a couple of degrees, it could completely change the sex ratios um, of our turtle populations. And we could end up with all males, all females, um, certainly not kind of the even mix that we need right now for successful populations. So those are a couple of things. Also, when you think about how connected they are, is the vegetation changes, if the macroinvertebrates change, if their food changes, um, those can also be threats uh, due to climate change. Absolutely. Uh, uh, sex determination of turtles is fascinating. And that's true for most reptiles. Is that correct? It is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Very cool. Um, another temperature question. How did the turtles survive the coldest weather? And do species have different adaptations to the cold? Yeah, so um, if we're talking about kind of our species specifically, the, the painted and the pond turtles, um, the cool thing about painted turtles is that they're actually a really common species across the US. There are a couple of different subspecies, but they actually range across most of the entire country. Um, and so they live everywhere from, you know, basically Canada down to Texas. And each of those subpopulations, those subspecies it's been shown have kind of adapted to their local environment. So those that are, um, you know, reproducing and growing in uh, really cold environments um, tend to have adaptations that allow them to survive those. So their blood chemistry is going to be a little bit different. Their ability to do that cloacal breathing might be a little bit uh, enhanced. Um, they might have a, a, a better ability for their blood to not freeze when it's freezing temperatures. So here in the Pacific Northwest, we don't usually get super cold temperatures, um, but we definitely get periods where the ponds freeze. And so they need to be able to get underneath that frost line, underneath the ice um, into the mud so that they can uh, survive and at least stay above 32 degrees, ideally. <laughs> um, yeah, amazing adaptation. It's very cool. Um, next question, is there a place we to donate so we can help the native turtles or their conservation? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's actually a fund that um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has called the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund. Um, and again, we can put a, uh, a link on the uh, in the chat maybe. Um, but it's a fund where a million dollars was set aside for wildlife conservation, but Fish and Wildlife doesn't have access to it until it's matched with another million dollars. So they're actually trying to raise a million dollars right now so that they'll have access to the full $2 million. So that would be a really great um, option for folks. Cool. Um, another question, what are the, what's some of the best vegetation for turtle habitat if one has a property near water? Yeah, so we kind of talked about, they need a diversity of different types of habitat for the different parts of their life cycle. So. Um, as adults, they need to be primarily in the pond with basking um, habitat. Think about, you know, what are they eating? They're eating all these insects and vegetation. So you need to have a really healthy um, uh, food web in the water. So you want to have different floating vegetation, different emergent vegetation, um, underwater vegetation that's going to, you know, really produce a diversity of food for them. And then the hatchlings, when they're super tiny, when they're that little quarter sized hatchling, like I showed you with the snapping turtle. Um, most of their time is spent just hiding and trying to not be seen and not be eaten. So they also need a lot of floating vegetation or um, piles of sticks and logs at the edge of the shore that they can kind of burrow into and hide behind and stay protected from. And then nesting, we actually need very little vegetation on the shoreline for nesting because again, the temperature of the nest is going to determine the sex of the babies. And so the female is going to pick a place on the shoreline that's going to get hopefully the right amount of sunlight. So if she lays her eggs and then all of a sudden grasses grow over the nest or a big tree shades it out, that could you know potentially really alter what um, the sex ratio is to that nest. So it kind of depends a little bit. 
cool. Um, this is a comment, not a question, but <laughs> from, from Jayla um, says, I'm seven and the baby turtles are very cute. Just wanted yes, to share that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, also, before I forget, I misspoke in the uh, recorded video. So um, I couldn't think of the name of hibernation for turtles. And if there is a technical name, it's called brumination. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to mention that because I felt uh, quite silly not knowing that name uh, during the recorded interview. So yes, brumination is what turtles do when they hibernate in the winter. Awesome. Wow, that's very cool. Um, and kind of following Jayla's comment, there's a couple of uh, folks on the webinar who work with elementary students, and they are wondering mm -hmm. if you do this presentation or a version of it for elementary students. And you can answer, I also have <laughs> an answer as well, <laughs> but go for it first. Um, I do. I love taking school groups out into the field and showing them some of these really cool things. It's a little bit challenging with COVID. So, um, you know, coming into this coming spring, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but it's definitely a possibility. So if folks are looking for um, a cool way to get their kids out on a field trip or out into nature, definitely look me up. Awesome. And then with during COVID times, this um, whole webinar is recorded. So um, happy to share it with whomever um, and might share it out to the whole audience as well after. Um, so if you want to show it as is to your elementary students or part of it, um, that'll be available as well. Um, so awesome. Um, another question, um, do turtles have ears? <laughs> oh, that's a great one. Yeah. So, so I do a lot of work with amphibians and reptiles, right? And when you think about a frog, you think about that tympanum, that kind of membrane where the eardrum is kind of right flush with the side of the head. So most reptiles actually have ear holes. So they don't have this fleshy part of the ear on the outside like we do. They basically just have the hole with the eardrum inside. So that's what turtles have. That's what a lot of snakes have. Um, sometimes it's not very obvious, it's so small. Um, but they usually have some kind of an ear canal or ear hole of some kind um, to hear through. One or two more questions that I'm missing here in the chat. Um, this might be last chance if you want to type one in. Um, let's see. Um, if you have time and, mm -hmm. and you know, can you describe the plan to help the turtles in East Pond at Whitaker Ponds when that pond's drained and rehabilitated? Yeah, so um, we're really um, lucky and um, grateful that we're that Portland Parks and Rec is is an active partner in the project. So I'm very involved in kind of the the planning as well as the implementation of how this project's going to go. So kind of every step of the way, um, I'm kind of consulting on some of the wildlife. Uh, conservation pieces of the project. So we have some plans as to how to um, kind of pre-capture as many turtles as possible before the water is drained um, and put them in a safe place. And then also during the project um, to be able to capture turtles that we might miss with our with our trapping. So along the whole way, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna be on site <laughs> most likely, um, and we're gonna have a variety of different methods and strategies for making sure that all of the wildlife, including the turtles, um, are kept safe throughout that project. Cool. Um, another question, is there a way to tell if, if turtles are related um, for your long-term studies? Yeah, good question. So if you, uh, you have to, you really have to do genetic testing. You really have to look at their blood and do genetic testing to see if they're genetically uh, related, but there can be some um, trends. So for example, we talked about, I talked about their, their back shell, their carapace, right? So their carapace is actually divided kind of like a soccer ball into multiple scoots. And they have kind of a typical number of scoots, but sometimes they'll be born with kind of an alternative number of scoots. Like instead of five scoots that go right down the spine, they might have four or they might have six. And we tend to see those patterns throughout a nest. So um, typically if a mother or a father has um, uh, one of those abnormalities, the babies will as well, not all of them, but some of them will, and usually multiple of the babies from that nest will. So it's not an identifier, but it is definitely a trend that I've seen as I've um, looked at nests. Wow, that's really interesting. I had no idea they were called scoots. <laughs> that's cool. Um, another question, what are turtles doing at night? 
Oh, good question. So if you think about it, when do you usually see turtles? You see them basking in the middle of the day, right? And why are they basking? They're basking because um, they need the heat of the sun to help them to metabolize food. We have an internal heater, our metabolism that helps us to digest food and fight disease and illness and that kind of thing. Turtles don't have that. So the actual sun is really kind of radiating um, into their body and giving them the heat that they need to do those life processes. So during the day, they're usually spending most of their time up on logs, digesting their food. And then at night is when they go into the water and start feeding. So usually when I do um, my trapping, I'll do it overnight. I'll set the traps in the afternoon and check them first thing in the morning, because at that point, the turtles have are kind of all basked out um, and they're hungry and they want to go into the traps. They want to go into the water and get food. Um, and then I can also release them first thing the next morning before they have a chance to um, miss any basking time. Awesome. Um, we're almost done. It's just about seven o'clock. <laughs> we have um, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, if you were a turtle, or which turtle would you be? Oh, that's a great question. So we have um, aquatic turtles. So we've been talking about our native Oregon turtles. We have two species of turtles, the painted in the pond. Both of them are considered aquatic turtles because they spend most of their time in the pond. They have webbed feet, um, but there are a whole different classification of um, kind of the turtle family that are land tortoises. And I actually have a couple of them at home that um, friends had and didn't want anymore and they needed to be rehomed. And so I took them and I have one particular little turtle as a Russian tortoise named Little Dude. And um, he crawled into my heart in March of 2015, and he just is the grumpiest old man turtle. And he's only about this big, but I would be little dude because he has the life of luxury um, and he just gets to be grumpy and upset all the time and eat lots of kale. So I would be little dude. <laughs> Sounds like a great life. Yeah. <laughs> and a long life too, I would imagine. Right. <laughs> yeah, around for a while. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura. This was um, fascinating and really interesting. Really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone that's attended. Um, hope you all have really enjoyed it. Um, we'll share out the recording of this if you want to watch it later or share with students or anything. And also send out the phone number for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Oregon uh, Conservation Recreation Fund information as well. So we have more webinars coming up next year. Um, next month, we're starting our Living with Floods webinar series. It's a four-part webinar series, and we're going to look at um, flooding and floodplain management um, through a bunch of different lenses. It should be really interesting. So stay tuned for that um, in January. And thank you all so much for attending. And thank you again, Laura. Um, it's been wonderful. And hope you all have a, have a lovely evening. Excellent. And I just put my email in the chat box for anybody that wants to follow up with any questions or anything. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank